Hi, I'm Barney Leith. My colleague Dan Wheatley and I look forward to serving as your tutors and mentors throughout this course about the promise of world peace. This remarkable document was promulgated by the Universal House of Justice in 1985, and its message is still completely relevant 32 years later, perhaps even more so. It was published on the occasion of the International Year of Peace. It outlines the major prerequisites for peace, as well as the obstacles working against peace. In January 1988, the peace statement had been presented to 198 heads of state, and it had been translated into 76 languages, and an estimated 1 to 2 million copies had been disseminated to people around the world. Before we delve into the text itself, it would be helpful to think about the state of the world now. Just how peaceful is the world in 2017? Every year, the Institute for Economics and Peace, the IEP, publishes a Global Peace Index. This is a comprehensive report on conflict and peace in the world in the last year. It's well worth downloading and reading, or even just skimming this report, which you can download from the Vision of Humanity website at the address on the screen now. Believe it or not, the world was marginally more peaceful in 2017 than it had been in 2016. This graphic shows the top five countries that have become more peaceful in the past year and the top five countries that have become less peaceful. But, according to the report, the world has become 2.14% less peaceful over the last decade. This includes a huge increase in battle deaths, a substantial growth in the numbers of deaths from terrorism, and the number of refugees, internally displaced persons and others of concern to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees has doubled. As I'm sure you will agree, these are not comfortable figures. So we, and by we I mean all humankind, surely have to give deep and serious thought as to how we can bring about peace in the world. This raises the question, what kind of peace should we be thinking about? The Institute for Economics and Peace proposes what they call positive peace. What do they mean by positive peace? Well, if negative peace is the absence of violence or the fear of violence, positive peace consists in the attitudes, institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. In this, the thinking of the IEP is close in some respects to the message of the promise of world peace. The IEP's model for positive peace is based on eight factors or pillars. These eight pillars are a well-functioning government, sound business environment, low levels of corruption, high levels of human capital or social capital, equitable distribution of resources, good relations with neighbours, acceptance of the rights of others, and a free flow of information. The Global Peace Index is derived from research and from scores based on the research assigned to the world's countries on each of these dimensions. As you can see from the graphic, the pillars of positive peace are linked and interact with each other in complex ways. All of this is undoubtedly admirable, but it seems to me that something is missing from this model. In the promise of world peace, 
the Universal House of Justice makes it utterly clear that much of what we think we should do to bring peace to the world just is not going to have a lasting effect. To quote from the document, banning nuclear weapons, prohibiting the use of poison gases, or outlawing germ warfare will not remove the root causes of war. However important such practical measures obviously are as elements of the peace process, they are in themselves too superficial to exert enduring influence. Peoples are ingenious enough to invent yet other forms of warfare and to use food, raw materials, finance, industrial power, ideology and terrorism to subvert one another in an endless quest for supremacy and dominion. How true this is! We can see all of these forms of war by other means being inflicted on a sorely troubled humanity day in and day out. And the communications and internet technologies that have developed since the promise of world peace was given to the world by the Universal House of Justice now provide those who wish to wage war without firing a gun or dropping a bomb with a wealth of means to bring destruction to their enemies. So what is the missing ingredient? Religion. As the promise of world peace states, no serious attempt to set human affairs aright to achieve world peace can ignore religion. Baha'u'llah says, Religion is the greatest of all means for the establishment of order in the world and for the peaceful contentment of all that dwell therein. And yet this is the one factor that is all too often ignored by politicians, academics and others who are working on ideas to bring sustainable peace to the planet. Some admittedly destructive and negative expressions of religion have led to religions being seen as part of the problem. And no doubt such expressions of religion are very much part of the problem. However, something like 80% of the world's population identify with one or another form of religion. And the vast majority of those long for a deeply rooted and genuine peace and for humanity to be united as one family. This peace is within reach, no matter how dire the world's situation can seem. This course will give us an opportunity to study in depth the text of the promise of world peace and a wide range of supporting materials. Dan and I very much look forward to accompanying you on this exciting journey.